Well, good evening. I want to thank you for joining me on this Tuesday in the season of Easter. Let's begin with prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for the many blessings, especially the gift of Jesus Christ in this Easter season. It reminded again of the new life that we share in Jesus. And so we pray you bless us as we open up the Holy Scriptures today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to continue our study of the book of Acts because these are often the wonderful stories that we read during the season of Easter. We hear about how excited, how full of life the early church was, and we can't help but sometimes reflect and say, hmm, where have we lost some of that excitement, some of that energy that the early church had? Same things that happened in the early church can still and does still happen today in this world through the activities of the church of Jesus Christ. So this lesson, the thing with this lesson is it's a lesson that's just kind of dropped in our lap and it seems to be out of context and you can't figure out what it is. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about today's lesson because I love the story behind it. It is a story about a man named Cornelius. Now, uh, I know, we're thinking, what, the fifth element? I don't know, Cornelius. Wasn't, wasn't uh, he in the fifth element, uh, the, the uh, priest? Let me see, what else? Cornelius, oh, that's right, uh, Planet of the Apes, there you go. So you probably heard the name Cor Cornelius. Planet of the Apes, all right. So that's for all you geeky people. Um, Cornelius, uh, by the way, neither of these. So let me erase that. He was none of those. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. What does it mean? He's a leader of, you know, a large army, okay? He's a centurion. So he's a man of great respect. These are oftentimes were political positions. He was appointed, so he was well-connected with a lot of different people. And we are told in the Bible that he was a devout man. Now, this goes all the way back to the book of Acts chapter 9, okay? So you have to understand that this story for today starts all the way here. He wants to learn more about God, and we've got another character here that's important, this man named Peter. Now, we know Peter. Peter, of course, one of the disciples of Jesus, now an apostle. Remember what we said what an apostle was? An apostle was one of the disciples of Christ who had an experience with the resurrected Christ and therefore is sent out to proclaim that good news. Now, there are no apostles today because they're all gone. Now, I know that you have a lot of churches that will call people apostles, but they are not. We have not had that physical, tangible experience with the resurrection. And so that was something that was only reserved for those disciples of Christ who physically, tangibly saw Christ in the time of his resurrection before his ascension to heaven. One exception, of course, to that is Paul, but um, there's more to that story that we can look at some other time when we get to Paul. So Cornelius, Peter. Peter was uh, told by God, or given a vision by God, uh, in the chapter 9 of this sheet that was came down before Peter, and on the sheet were all sorts of unclean animals. And God said to him, go and eat. And he's like, are you kidding me? I'm not going to eat. These are unclean animals. This vision happened three times. And God said to him, are you going to call unclean something that I have created? Really? See, Peter was talking about the purity laws and thinking about the purity laws that on, on what we now call the Old Testament. Okay? There are all these purity laws that the Jews followed in order to indicate their fidelity to God, to demonstrate that they were somehow different than the surrounding nations. In fact, I, you know, this is hyperbole. I'm just, this is not a completely studied position. So I want to make sure that you're clear on this and don't quote this. But I would say probably 80 to 90 percent of the Old Testament law, 80 to 90 percent, is this type of law. It's the type of law that indicated the fidelity that the Jews were to have towards God to distinguish them from the other nations, but they are not once and for all laws 
that we should follow for all time. And so we have Christians who pick and choose, by the way, some of the laws that they like in the Old Testament and say, you're not following these laws. For instance, the Seventh-day Adventists are just adamant about the fact that you must worship on the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday. And if you're not worshiping God on Saturday, you are not being faithful to God. These are, these are just part of the purity laws. You know, we already deal with these types of things in the New Testament. These things are falling apart. They're no longer necessary because no longer are the Jews to be one cohesive unit. It's not, a, it, it, it's not about cohesive unit of Jewish purity. That indicates your relationship with God, because now God is trying to open up the kingdom of heaven to everybody. So these purity laws are no longer of importance. They're Old Testament law. The nation of Israel is no longer the way that God demonstrates his love to the world. God has chosen a new people that includes the Jews. It starts with the Jews. But now they're being faithful to go out into the world and spread the good news to everybody. This is, of course, the purpose of the vision. Don't call unclean what I've created, God said. Of course, he's referring to the Gentiles. Now, I imagine that even many of the Christian Jews at the time of Jesus or shortly after would still have a hard time eating pig. That just wasn't going to happen. However, the impact of this lesson is simply that God wants to open up the kingdom to everybody. This is the whole purpose and has always been the purpose of God choosing the Jews, that they might be a light to the nations. So Peter goes and preaches to Cornelius. And we are told that his entire family is so enthralled by the message that they heard that they come to Jesus Christ to a relationship with him and the entire family is baptized. And this is the context in which we hear our lesson for today. So Peter is preaching to Cornelius, to his family, so while Peter was still saying these things, he was giving a testimony to his faith in Jesus Christ, to Cornelius and his family. The Holy Spirit fell. Oh, this is great. Hold on. So we're getting into Acts chapter 10 right now. The Holy Spirit. So we always see the Holy Spirit kind of as a descending dove. In Christian theology, if you see this, you'll see this type of image in our sanctuary upstairs. The descending dove represents the gift of the Holy Spirit coming down upon us. And so uh, we don't have the Spirit going upwards. I, I don't want to make too big of a point of this, but you know, sometimes we'll see a dove kind of more like that. This, you know, our in Christian artwork. Typically, the Holy Spirit is represented by a dove coming down upon us. It's a gift from heaven. So look at this. The Holy Spirit fell down upon all who heard it. Who? Everyone. That includes, let me see here, Cornelius, this Roman centurion. This Gentile man. Listen to the shock of this. The believers from among the circumcised. Okay, so this is kind of a euphemistic phrase, I guess. Among the circumcised, who would that be? Well, basically a Gentile was uncircumcised. A Jew would have been circumcised. So it's kind of, it's kind of a phrase that's meant to refer to those who are Jewish. So the Jewish folk, who are also Christian, okay, so the Christian Jews, so the believers from among the circumcised who came with Peter were amazed. Why were they amazed? They were amazed because the Holy Spirit had been never been poured out, had been, because the Holy Spirit 
had been poured out even on the Gentiles. So all Gentiles. So this is kind of really, a, you know, the fantastic nature of this lesson is we get these two groups represented here. Okay, the Gentiles and, of course, the Christians, the Jewish Christians. They would have considered themselves fulfilled Jews, people who believed in, in, in the, the fact that the Messiah had finally come and so forth. For these were fulfilled Jews and so forth. They finally got what they've been praying and dreaming for all of these years. And now all of a sudden, God is falling upon the Gentiles. And he would have just shake them and say, haven't you guys ever heard the Bible? Wasn't this the entire point of the entire Old Testament is that God wanted to choose the Jews so that the entire world might be blessed? And this was always the problem with the nation of Israel. They kept forgetting that they weren't chosen because they were somehow special and better than the other nations. They were chosen because God wanted to use them as the source, as the beginning point in which the entire world would be blessed. So here they are shocked, but this is where the whole point of God from the very beginning, that everybody be blessed. So what happened here? They had to overcome their bigotries. They were bigots, okay? They were bigots, man, against Gentiles, against the uncircumcised, the dirty people, the filthy people. Remember what did God tell Peter? Are you going to call unclean the handiwork of my love and my hands? They had to overcome their bigotries against the Gentiles. They had to start seeing them as clean and beautiful people whom God wanted to claim as well. Let's finish your lesson. They heard the Gentiles, I'm adding that word because that's the implication here, they heard them, the circumcised heard the Gentiles speaking in tongues and extolling God. Speaking in tongues, okay. Um, this is not necessarily the vision that you have of the Assemblies of God Church and people speaking chaos and all these uh, gibberish, okay? They were basically giving testimony to their faith. So you might have somebody who speaks Greek over here, and you might have somebody who speaks Latin over here, and you might have somebody uh, who speaks Aramaic over here, and all of a sudden people, Gentiles, were witnessing of their faith. They were speaking in all these languages and witnessing to those around you. Now, I'm not saying that there might not have also been something other supernatural taking place here, that maybe they're speaking in a tongue that nobody else understood, but I don't think that's the implication. What's the point of a tongue that nobody understands? Even the Bible says that. The whole purpose of these tongues is so that the message might be go, go out to every language. Again, this is a way that the Bible is trying to tell us that God is trying to make sure that the message is communicated to everybody who's listening. The tongues, the different languages, okay? Going on verse 47, can anyone forbid water, Peter said, for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And so he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Christ. And then they asked him to remain for several days. Okay. So Peter overcame his bigotries, understood that he was called as a, an ambassador of Christ, an apostle, to take the message to the Gentiles. He had to overcome his bigotries, and so did the other Christians, and understand that now God wants to operate all over the world in everybody's life. So, I want to conclude with this. Because there are a couple of things that we need to learn. No one
is unclean. There is not one person in this world beyond the work and the redemption of God if you and I have the courage to take the message to them. No one's unclean. We excuse ourselves from proclaiming the good news to other people because they're different than us. We have to overcome our... We are bigots, okay? We have to overcome our bigotries if we are going to realize that there is no one unclean. There is nobody that is outside of the realm of God's intended salvation. So that's the number one thing. Overcome your bigotries towards people. <laughs> when I came to this church, there were so many bigotries towards black people. It's a Slovak congregation. And I kept running into these. And the folks would say, you know, I'd actually have a, a person say, well, this is all fine. Well, a good, this old time Slovak. But I bet you wouldn't take your daughter to a black doctor. I said, I'll tell you what, if it's the dang best doctor in the world, I don't care. And he's just like, what? I'm not going to take him to a, my daughter to a doctor just because, oh, by the way, her doctor was a person of color. All right? And when I told them that, they were just flabbergasted. What? You take your daughter to somebody who's black? Well, she was darker skinned. She was, she was, her family heritage are from India, but nevertheless, very dark skinned person of color. We have to overcome our bigotries. She was the best doctor in the world. Who cares? You know, I'm going to tell you something about skin color. We all have the same color skin. We just have different shades. And so we need to overcome our bigotries about these stupid things. There might be cultural differences, but those things are kind of exciting. We need to overcome these bigotries. Bigotries about, you know, whether it's the color skin or cultures from which we come. Um, however we tend to try to want to approach God. I mean, we have these bigotries towards other religions. You know, oh, they're Muslims. I mean, I, 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 there's nothing that drives me more crazy than, than the folks who call them Muslims. And they actually put this down here. First of all, that's not how you spell it. It's Muslims. Okay? And we need to respect that they too are who? Not unclean. They fall under God's care. And God wants to bring them into the plan of redemption as well, too. And most Muslims are goodly, kindly people. We need to overcome our bigotries. I know a whole lot of hate-filled Christians, though, let me tell you. Because we're bigots. No one is unclean. No one is unclean. But let me leave you with something really positive. You are not unclean. No one is unclean. You are not unclean. There are some, a percentage of people who through life have had it beat into their heads that they are somehow unworthy, unclean, disgusting, and dirty. <laughs> this was beat into me when I was growing up by my stepfather. You're stupid. You're an idiot. Bam! 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 He punched me in the face, knocked me to the ground, kick me in the ribs and tell me how stupid and idiotic I was. Oh, I believe that. There's still some, sometimes that message comes back into my brain. I'm unworthy. I'm unclean. I'm no good. You are not unclean. You are not unworthy of God's love. Women who've been raped. I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I just, look at this, I'm dirty, what did I do to deserve this? You did nothing to deserve that! Nothing! Not a thing! 
You're not the problem. The other person who did that to you was the problem. No one is unclean. You are not unclean. You are not. Okay. God is opening up the kingdom of heaven. He wants to drop his Holy Spirit upon you. No one's unclean. You're not unclean. And so I'm inviting you today to an exciting journey. A relationship with Christ. Here's what God wants to do. God wants to drop this spirit upon you. Okay? Fill you with his spirit. Overcome our bigotries. Bring us into relationship with Christ. And just transform your life. No one is unclean. You are not unclean. The Holy Spirit wants to fall upon you tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the witness of Peter, how faithful he was. Despite his bigotries, he overcame these things and proclaimed this message to Cornelius. And in turn, by extension, we understand that now this message is for us. And so I'm praying for all those who've had life. Life is just beaten into them, how unworthy and how undeserving, how dumb and how stupid they are, how unclean they are. God, no one is unclean. They are the handiwork of God. And so I'm praying that you would fall upon them this evening with the gift of your Holy Spirit, that their lives might be transformed. For he asks us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm inviting God's blessing upon you today. If you've been touched tonight in some powerful way, give us a testimony of that. Let us know on our Facebook page or call me uh, for those who know how to get a hold of me. Uh, we'd certainly be grateful. Go on our Facebook page, just leave a message and say, hey, I'm just so grateful for this message tonight. And yeah, God is really trying to teach me and touch me too. And we will pray for you and we're so grateful for you. So may God's blessing be upon you this day. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give shower upon you his grace, his mercy, his peace, and his love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May you go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God's Spirit guide you today. Amen.